So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go on site to a location and literally bridge two buildings together that need it. Now, where am I going? I'm going to Northern Arizona. Arizona is the most awesome state in the world because you get the best climate zones within a two hour drive of each other. And the great thing is my parents own a cabin up in Northern Arizona and they have a neighbor who would like to share the internet connection. So I'm gonna drive up there with my camera and some point to point wireless bridging gear and set it all up. Now, one thing I plan to do is film a little bit more of the physical installation. I find that people struggle most not with the configuration of the point to point wireless bridge. I'll show that too, but more so how do you get those wireless access points on the building securely? All right, well, I've obviously arrived up at the cabin. I'm in the middle of the forest. This is gonna be awesome. Well, let me show you a little bit of what we have going on. If you look over here to the left, this is my parents' cabin. This is where the internet connection comes in, and that's gonna be where we beam the internet access. Our primary goal is right across the way to the neighbor's house. This is the guy I've been working with. I installed video surveillance at that cabin, and he was like, hey, if I could share that internet connection and split the cost with you, that'd be awesome. So this is objective number one, is to beam the internet access across the way from this cabin to this cabin. Let's take a good look at my parents' cabin and see what we've got going on there. Take a look at what we have here. Uh, we've got the DSL modem coming in over here on the right-hand side, and that bridges into a Cisco SG300 10-port switch. Uh, it's an awesome switch. It's a Layer 3 switch. Do you really need Layer 3 switching at a cabin? Uh, yeah. Um, and this also supplies power over Ethernet, so we can plug in video surveillance, Wi-Fi, all that kind of stuff, and get power from this switch. Uh, right next to it, we have a cell phone signal booster because there's very little cell signal up here. So this generates a cell signal and converts it to Wi-Fi for, it looks like, Verizon phones, which unfortunately is not mine. Uh, and then on top of it, I have a little ubiquity wireless access point that I installed a long time ago just to supply wireless access to this cabin itself. Now, this is what we need to connect into the bridge that we would mount on the outside of the cabin to shoot the wireless signal, essentially shoot this LAN connection over to the neighbor's house. Now I'm heading back outside because I want to show you what I was thinking. This is the wall that faces the neighbor's cabin. And up at the top of that, I see not only a light fixture over to the left, but there's a little electric cord coming out just to the right. And I'm thinking if I can figure out how that electric cord is fed there, I could feed an ethernet cable right there and mount it directly on that wall. All right, now that the cabling is done, it's time to talk about the Ubiquiti secret sauce. Uh, Ubiquiti really got started making really cheap point-to-point -point bridges at a time where nothing like it existed in the industry. If you wanted a point-to-point -point wireless bridge between two locations, you were paying thousands, tens of thousands of dollars for equipment to mount it. They came up with stuff around $100 that could do the same thing. And this is what I brought from home. These are actually a, a few years old. They're my old Nano Station Loco M5s. They're a five gigahertz wireless bridge. You can see they're nice and yellow with age. Uh, that, that shoots a signal, if I remember right, maybe two or three miles. Uh, but when I came up here, I thought, man, I wonder what they've got now. So I did a little searching and, and bought uh, <laughs> their latest solution, the Lightbeam AC uh, from, from uh, Amazon. I think it ended up being $70 or $80 for, for each one of these. And I thought, oh, let's try it. But I'm astounded by how large this box is. So let's see what we're getting ourselves into. Open this guy up. Nice. I love it, but the cabin owners won't. That's that's huge. Uh, when I saw it on the website, I think it said it, it uh, shoots a wireless signal about 13 miles over uh, clear sight. 
This is great, but I think I'm going to install my old uh, nano stations here. They work just fine, and they're not going to be this giant eyesore sitting on the side of the cabin. So we'll go that route. They both run the same software, so the configuration is exactly the same. It's just one shoots a signal much further than we actually need, and the size dictates that accordingly. Now, I know one of the challenging pieces will be mounting this on the side of the cabin. You can see these things are meant to be mounted around like an iron pole sticking out. They actually come with these guys uh, that slip through there and tighten down so you can get a secure hold on there. But there's no iron pole on the side of the cabin. So I was, I was walking around trying to figure out what to do, and I literally tripped across this leaning against the cabin. It's a dowel rod. And I was thinking, oh, man, if, if I could cut this down if I can find a saw around here and find screws long enough maybe I can take this right into the wall of the cabin and then wrap this guy around and mount that right on this dowel rod tied to the side let's see if it works I love my dad he may not have a handsaw but he does have a sliding compound miter saw it's a shame I'm gonna have to use something like this for such a small job <laughs> not bad We should cut one more just in case. Ah! We're good. I also found four screws that should do the trick. I'm getting creativity points right now. Let's see if it works. Well, this should work out really well. Cool. And for number two. Ah, I cut that one too short. May have to improvise with this. I'm thinking two screws right at the top should secure this guy. What do you think? That looks good. Should do. Now the real test. Ooh. There we go. Like a glove. That's not going anywhere. Oh, I love this. Last but not least, Ethernet connection. Perfect. Last thing worth mentioning, keep in mind most of the ubiquity point-to-point -point stuff uses their proprietary power over Ethernet, so you're going to need to use one of these inline couplers to inject power down the line. So. At the cabin MDF, I've got this black cable, which goes to the switch. That'll plug into this LAN port right here on the coupler. This is the one that actually runs to the uh, WAP mounted on the outside of the cabin. I'm going to plug that into this line here that says PoE, and then jack this into a wall outlet to supply power on the line. Well, here's the MDF of the neighbor's cabin, as you can see, a little handiwork of my own right here. Definitely not as pretty as my parents, but at the same time, functional. This is the power injector that runs actually power to the patch panel, which feeds the outside WAP. Now all we've got left is to configure these guys. First things first, when you Google the NanoStation default IP, you find out it's 192.168.1.20. So I went ahead and set my computer's IP address to 192.168.1.10 so it's in the same subnet. Let's drag a command prompt into the window and just do a quick ping, 192.168.1.20. Sure enough, we're there, good. So I'll slide open a web browser and do a 192.168.1.20 in the browser window. And I've got the initial logon screen for the AirOS, that's the operating system Ubiquity created for these guys. 
I'm going to agree to the terms of use and the default username and password, again, just from Google, uh, will tell you it's UBNT, UBNT. Select the country. We're going to say United States. And you can see right here, Canada, Puerto Rico, United States, every country of the world has different wireless frequency restrictions. So it's really important that you pick the right country. Otherwise, you may see frequencies allowed that shouldn't be for your region or vice versa. Frequencies that should work won't be there. I'll hit login. Load, load, load. And we're in. I'm looking at this guy. He's on version 5.6.2 of the Air OS. It's always where I start. What upgrades are available? Do a quick search for Ubiquiti Air OS. Download. Download page. And then browse into the model that we've got, the Nanostation NSM5. It looks like they've got version 6.1.2 out that was released just a few days ago, at least from when I'm talking to you now. Let's download that one. And download file. Sure. All right, we're downloaded. Let's head on over to the system and upload our new firmware. There's our file. Open and upload. All right, looks like it took that and we'll hit update. Let this guy run through. And boom, we're back at the logon screen. It looks a little different than before. That's good. Log in, default username and password. And we are upgraded. Now just watching the frequency band here, it looks like it's jumping through and scanning the different frequencies to see what's out there. Now there's a lot of stuff that we could do, but I'm gonna go after core functionality here. Our goal, bridge the two cabins. First thing I'm gonna do is hop on over to the network tab, verify the network mode is set up as bridge to where we're literally bridging the two cabins together. I'll make the IP address 192.168.1.15 on one of them, and we'll plan to make the other one .16. Now if this were anything but a cabin, this would be a lot more professional. IP addressing schemes, documentation, switch port maps that we're plugging into. And I've got to tell you, behind the scenes, for my parents' cabin anyway, that's what it is. When my parents call in a year and tell me something's not working, I want to be able to have a quick reference without driving up there to figure out what's going on. Let's dismiss this little box. IP address is set. I'll hit the change button. Now look at that. It makes me change the default password. Fill in my information and change. Apply. Type the new IP address in up there. And we're good. Log in with the new password. And now I'm going to head over to the wireless tab. On one side, I'm gonna configure it as an access point. On the other side, I'm gonna configure it as a station. So since this is the first one I'm configuring, it will be the access point side of it. We'll make the SSID cabin bridge. Now you'll notice it's not letting me change the 802.11 wireless mode. It's stuck on A slash N in the five gigahertz range because that's the kind of device that I have, an M5, five gigahertz. I'll throw a little security on there. WPA2 AES, and we'll type in our secret key. I'll show it to you. It's five sevens and five eights. Again, there's a lot we could do with this. We could change the frequency to a certain frequency and fix it. We could modify the output power to be exactly what we need to reach between the two cabins. Again, for now, I just want it to work. Click on change, apply, and our new wireless network is alive. All right, now I walked over to the other cabin and just for the sake of time behind the scenes, reconfigured that nanostation M5 with the correct IP address, and upgraded the firmware. Now the only difference on this side is we're gonna head over to that wireless tab and instead of configuring it as an access point, we're gonna configure it as a station. And one item of note is I've enabled the WDS transparent bridge, and I didn't show you this on the other side, but I did over there as well, which allows these things to truly bridge the two cabins together. Otherwise they act as endpoints essentially as routers between the two. It's not what I want. Now on this side, I'm simply gonna join the other wireless network. And I can do that by keying in the same SSID and wireless security down at the bottom. I'll do cabin bridge, wireless security, WPA2, five sevens, five eights. Just verify that, looks good, and change. Now because I selected it as a station, it's now going to look around and try and join the SSID cabin bridge. I'm gonna head back over to this main tab and see if we've got a connection. As of right now, not yet. Sometimes it takes a second to join. Boom, it just showed up. There's the AP Mac. Signal strength, negative 38 dBm. It's like standing right next to it. <laughs> Look at the difference between that signal strength and the noise floor. Oh, this is good. 300 megabit per second connection between those two cabins, which could help feed that 10 megabit per second internet connection in amazing ways. And look at that, it just did a quick test and said, hey, we've got some high quality, high capacity. Oh, this is so good. Let's hit the drop down on the tools and do a quick ping to the other side. This side is 192.168.1.16. I'm gonna type in 192.168.1.15 and click on start. 
And sure enough, we are peeing cleanly between the two cabins. Wireless bridge? Check. The networks of these two cabins are bridged together, and the internet connection that comes into one of them now reaches the other. 